Welcome to the next episode of the Here to Help podcast. I am so excited to talk to Tina today. She is a former foster youth and also a teacher, and she's going to share some tips for educators, school staff, daycare providers, tons of actionable things you can put into practice today. Good to see you. Yes. Thank you for joining me this evening. And I'm so excited to dive in. I know that my followers are going to be just like waiting on the edge of their seat to learn from you. So kick us off if you don't mind. Just tell us who you are, your connection to child welfare, and your experience in teaching. Yes. So my name is Tina Bauer, and I have a connection with the child welfare system because I was in it. I was in foster care for four years with my brother, and my connection to education is I have a degree in interdisciplinary studies, easy through six, and English as a second language, and I was a teacher. And so those are, those are my connections. I love it. And so you are the perfect person to kind of walk through with all of us how teachers can create safe spaces and also just really keep in mind some trauma-informed care as they approach teaching. So if we could just jump in, could you talk to us a little bit about just starting off, how do you create a safe space within the classroom? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's really like once you start thinking about it and like outlining it, I feel like it's very easy and it really makes sense. Um, but a few things that you can do is just think about your overall environment. I've been in a lot of different classrooms, especially kindergarten classrooms. They can be very overstimulating. Mm -hmm. Lots of colors, lots of pictures. You don't know where to look. Um, and yes, research, research shows that colors are good for kids and for their brain, but it also shows that too much stimulation makes them exhausted, mm -hmm. as we all probably know. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I like to start out with just calm decorations, calm colors, keeping maybe two or three colors in your entire theme. Um, think about the lighting, have warm lighting. I like to put up Christmas lights because they're a lot less harsh than the mm -hmm. big overhead lights. I like to keep the windows open. Um, I like to have a space where my kids can take a break. Um, not really like a timeout corner, but a break corner. Um, another thing I like to do is to have visual schedules. That's really good for really all kids. Um, you know, little pictures like this is, you know, outside recess, lunch, like all those types of things. Um, and especially if you have kids that rotate between teachers, that is so helpful. It's helpful for you too, as a teacher, yes. <laughs> um, especially if you're absent as well, because the kids can know, okay, it's a Monday, like this is the rotation we're doing. Um, and also having classroom routines clearly lined out visually and in writing so that the kids know this is what we're supposed to do, even if you're not there. Um, or, and especially in an emergency, so like a fire drill or anything like that. Um, and that can be especially important for kids in foster care because fire drills and things like that can be very traumatic. Um, and so it's good to have those things outlined and rehearsed very thoroughly. Um, another thing that I like to have is snacks for kids. Um, I mean, I know we've talked about yeah. kids who have food trauma, like having snacks available, I think is really important, especially healthy snacks. Mm -hmm. um, don't just shove them full of sugar. So those are just like a few things that, yeah. oh, one more thing I forgot. Um, I like to have affirmations up, um, and I'm really picky about my affirmations. Yes. Um, tell me. <laughs> some of them are yeah. so bad. Uh -huh. I feel like, um, but I like the ones that are like, I am brave. Like I'm a leader. Ones like that. You know, I don't like the ones that are like, I am smart. Like I just, there's hmm. just some I don't like, and I can yeah. share more on that later if you want, but I'm very picky about my affirmation. Okay. You mentioned two things. I, that's great. Thank you so much. I have this picture in my mind and I love it. I want to go to two parts that you just mentioned. So first the snacks, and it is something that, you know, I've talked a lot about, you know, kids maybe have experienced food insecurity or even, you know, trauma related to food. Can you, what does that look like? Like, do you have snacks out? Is there a pantry? Can you tell me like a little bit of the logistics of that and how it works? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I usually like to go for the snacks that are like individually packaged because then I don't have to touch anything. It helps reduce bugs, things like that. And it tends not to go bad as quickly. Um, but I would keep like cheese sticks in the, I had a mini fridge behind my desk. So the kids had to come up and ask me for it. Um, because that just worked best for our class. Mm -hmm. um, but they didn't have any trouble asking me for it. Um, and so 
that's kind of what we did. And then I had individually packaged snacks, like in one of my cabinets and there was a label on it, like snacks. And my kids, they always ask me and if for some reason they didn't ask me, um, one of their friends would call them out very quickly. <laughs> so that didn't happen very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I tried, I mean, as in everything I did, I tried to have it be student run so that the kids could just do it all. And of course they would ask me or they would sometimes just look at me and I'd be like, mm -hmm, go, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but just very much let them, let them run it. It's their classroom. And I think that's something, you know, when you're listening, it might feel a little shocking or feel like, I can't believe it. Wouldn't they just eat everything? You know, what would you say to that? Because I definitely get that pushback as we set up snacks in the home. Mm -hmm. Are Do you see that at the beginning of the year or how do you address it? Or is it not really a problem? Um, I don't think it's a big problem that I've had. Um, I know it is a concern and I've had other teachers come to me, like, how do you, how do you manage that? Um, and I think it goes back to just like the overall climate of the classroom. Mm. So like, if I tell the kids at the beginning of the year, like, this is your classroom, these are your things. Um, yes, they're mine, but I'm, you know, we're using them together. Mm -hmm. Um, just creating that sense of ownership in every area, the decorations, you know, the chairs, the tables, like if you create that atmosphere of ownership and general respect for the school's property and things like that, yeah. I found that you will see less of that behavior when it comes to snacks. Now I did have some kids who had food insecurities and they would like hide food in their desks or in their mm -hmm. backpacks and things like that. Um, and I just, you know, I chose to, to address that with them one-on-one -on -one. Yeah. in private. I don't believe in shaming them. Um, and we were able to resolve that. I had one kid, we needed a little bit more support. So we called in the school counselor. Um, so that's kind of yeah. how I dealt with it. Yeah. And on the same topic, you mentioned as you were walking us through a classroom, um, like a, it was not a timeout area. It was like a cool down area. So mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about what that looks like and how that is implemented? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was I, I love it because it was one of my kids' favorite spaces in the classroom. And at first they were like, I don't know how to use this. And I, but I really like modeled it for them and they thought it was hilarious. Um, <laughs> good, but then they good. all wanted to use it. Yeah, yeah. And that's another thing I love to do with kids, you know, especially for kids in foster care. Sometimes there can be like that mental block of like, what am I supposed to do? But I think showing kids exactly what to do is so powerful. Um, so a few of the things that were in my little corner, I had a bean bag with a washable cover because you know, we're kids. Yep. Because mm -hmm. yeah, we're kids. Um, I had a little lap desk. I had um, timers, which was really important because the kids knew they could go in there, set the timer. When their timer went off, they were done and they needed to move on to the next thing. It was totally student run. Of course, we had to do it a few times until yep. they understood. But I mean, it. I was very much hands off. It was their thing. Um, another thing that we had is we had a lot of different books. I really like a little spot of emotion books. Um, they're like these little plush spots of different emotions yeah. and the kids can like pull them. And then there's simple books that just explain the emotion. And it, I don't know what reading level it is, but it's really simple. And it was really great for my kids. Um, I also had, um, mental health checking. Over there. And my kids mm. love that. Um, I use like magnetic, like refrigerator um, shelf things. So it was like a magnetic spice rack, I think it's called. And you okay. put it on your fridge because I had like a whiteboard and magnetic bookshelves and everything is magnetic. And then I had little like jars and I accidentally yeah. did it with the zones of proximity, which I have no idea how I did that, but I did. Um, and then the kids would like put their little stick in there and they had their initials on the stick and they put their stick in there. Hmm. And then at the beginning of each rotation, I could go look at the sticks and say, okay, everybody is kind of just across the board today or everybody's mad today. Or, everybody's tired today. Yeah. Um, and then I could collect those sticks and then I would go to the front of the class and be like, well, I see that a lot of us are really tired today, you know? So we're, I'm just going to keep that in mind as we're going through our day. Um, and it really helped me get a very quick read on the kids. Like where are we at without, in a, in a confidential way, which was really important. Um, so, yeah. What other type of like um, positive behavior or like interventions are you doing in the classroom when something does come up? Could you give an example or walk us through when something does happen, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so my first year teaching, I actually had a very difficult class. Um, it was COVID times. Yeah. Um, and so 
it was just mayhem. Like I was told again and again, this is the worst year to teach. And it, it was really hard. I had a blended class of three different classes because we split all the kids up to be virtual. So it was just hard, Ooh. hard across the board. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, I really, really believe that in correcting children or addressing a behavior with a child, it should be done one-on-one. -on -one. I do not believe in shaming kids. Um, I really try to I really try to show people that kids are little people and they're going to be adults one day. And the things that we do now affect, affect who they're going to be when they grow up. Yeah. I feel like so many adults forget that. And we can just like call kids out in front of everyone else or shame them into behaving. Like that's not, that's not actually behavior. They're just scared of us. Um, so I try to do one-on-one -on -one. Um, I try to validate their emotions because often, you know, if you pull a kid aside, they will show, they'll be angry or they'll be upset or they'll be defensive. Yeah. And I try to validate those emotions. Like, okay, I see that you're feeling like, you know, really upset because I have asked to talk to you and you know that you may be in trouble because you did this. Um, and I try to validate that even if it is negative because there are emotions and kids seem to know that it's okay to feel the things that you're feeling. Yeah. Um, and then I try to just, um, ask questions to help understand why they did what they did. Um, and then, you know, I mean, nine times out of 10, there was a reason. Mm -hmm. And then I try to, you know, kind of talk them down from that reason. Like, okay, well, you know, we can't do that because this happens. And honestly, by the end of it, I didn't always need to hand out a consequence because they understood. Mm -hmm. They were able to see, okay, this is why. Um, and I will be honest, like that, that whole process is so much more work than just shaming the kid and being yes. like, don't do that. You know, yeah. like, it's not like, it's, it's not easier. It's mm -hmm. harder. But I found that in the long run, it was so much more beneficial than just being like, you know, sit down, like, yeah. no, <laughs> and I'm not perfect. I, I will of course, be honest. No I'm not is. perfect. Yes. I did that sometimes. <laughs> like, sit down now, mm -hmm. um, you know? <laughs> But yeah, so those are just some of the things that I would do. Yeah. And I think like, you know, kids in foster care are, we don't know what's happening at home in their life. And, you know, a quick little blip from their teacher can really trigger them or scare them or, you know, yeah. put them into like yeah. a fight or flight response. And, you know, I think by taking it one-on-one -on -one and really uncovering the need, it can, it can help. Um, so it doesn't become more escalated at times too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, the, the public shaming thing and, you know, and I, when we're talking about that, I'm assuming you're referring to like clip charts or those behavior charts, things like that. Yeah. Like clip cart, clip charts, behavior charts, um, taking away recess, mm -hmm. um, silent lunch, like all those kinds of things. I have seen them happen again and again, and I've yet to see them be successful. Yeah. What other things do you feel like um, maybe come up in your conversations with teachers that you that could be improved or maybe they thought it was well-meaning or the right path, but um, maybe was a misstep? Could you talk about, because I know you, you talk to teachers all the time. Um, mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you're seeing and, and can you offer some advice there? Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing that I see in education is that Teachers do what the teachers before them did. Mm. And so it's very much like, well, you know, the teacher before them has been teaching for 30 years and that's always what they did. Um, and so I feel like it's hard sometimes to introduce new ideas because teaching is so exhausting. You make so many decisions every single day. You work long hours. The last thing you want is somebody coming in and saying, you should be doing this. Yeah. Um, so that's why I try to make it very practical. You know, I try to incorporate it into what you're already doing. Um, so I'd say that's one of the biggest things that I run into with teachers. Um, and also just showing teachers that in the end, it makes their jobs easier. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes their relationships with the kids better. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know, the thing that I really ran into is, like I said, the shaming kids, that's a big thing. There seems to be this generalized attitude of adults are better than kids, and we're just mm -hmm. going to treat them that way. Whether that be that kids approach adults when they're in a conversation, and it's the reaction typically is like, go away, like we're talking. Yeah. Like, why are we talking to kids like that? Yeah. Like, 
you know, um, or just overall the school climate can sometimes be that way as well. Mm. Um, I have really struggled with school culture. It's very typical for school, t- school culture to be like, this is our family and we're all a family. And I'm like, you can't, can't do that. <laughs> like, yeah. you can't do that. You know, like, let's do where a school community, like, yes, we can do this guys. Come on. Cause that can be really triggering and confusing for kids in foster care. If it's, this is our family. And like, I mean, like in my class, they were like, make a family and friends wall. Mm, like, okay. Yeah, no, that's so interesting. Like, so you, ah! like the, the, the words family and some of those like family concepts absolutely can be triggering. What are some of the other little um, things that maybe come up that could be triggering that maybe people don't even realize? Yeah. So one thing that I tried to do when I was in the classroom as well was um, like your grownups or whoever's at home. I tried to say that. Um, if we were talking about mom and dad, I was like, if you have a mom, if you have a dad, because I know some of you do and some of you don't. Okay. Um, and I remember the first few times I said that, like there were some of my kids, like their faces, they were like, mm. you know, and some of my kids were like, wait, some people don't have a mom. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, some people don't have a mom. Yeah. And they were like, that's so sad. I was like, it is sad. Yeah. You know? And so we were able to have those really good conversations. Um, another thing that I would try to do is, um, like modify assignments. Of course, as we know, like the family Mm -hmm. tree, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Grandparents' Day, um, you know, just, I mean, everything really. Yeah. Because there's just, there's so many (laughs) Baby pictures, even like those types of like, you know, because you have to think about it. Like kids are coming from a different place and even mm-hmm. if they have all that information, they may not want to share about it. They may be unhappy right. with their family situation right, right. now. Right. And right. It is, yeah. Yeah. And maybe yeah. just like a triggering topic. I think that's like mm-hmm. such a good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I tried to have like variations of each assignment. And I also tried to have enough supplies and stuff so that if kids messed up and wanted to start over, mm-hmm. because often that would be it. They would start to share and then they'd be like, this is too much. And they break down crying. I'd be like, okay, this is, this is a trigger. So I'd be like, would you like a new thing? Do you want to start over again? They'd be like, yeah, because I've seen that again with other teachers, like kids would start and other teachers would be like, no, I give you one. That's it. Mm. I'd be like. So flexibility is really really key. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what, you know, I'm gathering is like this personalized approach that's flexible to your point. It is very hard. You know, I hear from teachers all the time, just it, it is exhausting and there's so Mm -hmm. many demands. Um, but you know, to your point, you've seen things work. So like, what are some of the responses or the reactions or positive things that come from all of this? Like, what have you seen the takeaway be? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I remember towards the end of the school year, I asked my kids, I was like, okay, on a sticky note, I want you to write, like, how do you feel in the classroom? Mm. And all of them, I mean, all 60 of them, I had three rotations of 20, all of them told me, I feel safe in your classroom. And I asked them why, why yeah. do you, I know I was like, I was like a puddle. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like it worked. Um, I was like, why? And they were like, because, you know, we can get anything we need. We can mm-hmm. ask you about anything. Um, you know, if we're in trouble, like we're not scared to be in trouble with you. Mm. Um, and that was a big thing. That's that was a big huge. thing. <laughs> That's yes, huge. Yes. Like I had. I would have kids come from other classrooms who weren't even in my class and they would come in and they'd be like, miss, the teacher told me that I wasn't allowed to come back in the classroom unless I found a pencil. Can I have a pencil? I promise I'll bring it back. And I was like, yeah, totally. And they always brought it back. Yeah, of course. But it's just things like that where it's like, you know, that they trusted me in that way because they saw that I respected them and I saw them as a person and I was willing to work with them on their struggles, not just yell at them or isolate them or just ignore them. Because I mean, I'll be honest, some of them, it was really hard. I mean, I had kids who like stuck pencils to their ears (laughs) and crawled around on the floor. Like, we had real stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But I think like, walking away from the year and kids feeling safe with you. I mean, that's as foster parents, something that we are trying to achieve as well. And it is not easy and it does take a lot of Mm -mm. energy, but 
you know, I hear it so often from former foster youth about how, you know, sometimes that teacher is the only person that they can trust or the only consistent thing in their life. And, you know, I think by providing those safe opportunities, you, you as the teacher can become that person for a child. And, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's miraculous. I didn't know what to expect when I asked that question, if you were going to, what they would say, but that's huge. Mm -hmm. Are there any other, other things in the class? Um, you, I mean, you mentioned a couple triggers already. So like, you know, feeling triggered when being called out, um, you mentioned a trigger about like a fire drill or things like that. Would you mind kind of sharing a little bit about how you, um, prepare kids who might be triggered? Cause we don't know they're often, we don't know what the triggers are. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. How do you prepare for them for that? Um, yeah, I think like when it comes to like fire drill or like lockdown drill, tornado drill, all those types of things, Mm -hmm. I try to just do generalized things that, you know, would help any kid. And that's the thing that I always come back to as well. It's like all these things will help kids who even aren't in foster care. Um, so like for fire drills, we always did like a buddy system, like find your buddy, go with your buddy. And if you notice, oh, my buddy's feeling really scared. My buddy's just standing there like this. Mm-hmm. Frozen. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to encourage my buddy to, you know, leave the classroom. Um, I always walked through the fire drill route and routines with my kids when the alarm, like before the alarm went off. Mm. Like we would just pick a random day and like, okay, we're just going to like, we're going to walk through this when it's not in, in the crisis mode. Um, because I know that, you know, when the crisis kicks in, like their brains can be gone. Um, and so that, I think that was one of the biggest things that I did. Um, I, I didn't yell at my kids when, when they didn't follow their routine during the fire drill, that was another thing I saw a lot of teachers do. They would like oh, scream that's at such their a kids. Good point. Yeah. And it doesn't help. You yeah. know, I would just, I literally was like, okay, just like, can you just hold my hand, please? Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, okay, no, you hold my hand. Now you hold, you hold his hand. Mm-hmm. And they're like eight year olds holding my hand. And I'm like, you know what? It's fine. We're going to talk about, we'll sort this out later. We just have to get out of the building. So yeah. just also just kind of having that flexibility of, we're just, you know, you're just going to have to do what well, it takes and to get also out. remaining regulated yourself. I yeah. think that, um, yeah. I know that these situations, especially with all these introductions of the lockdown drills are very stressful for rightfully mm-hmm. so, of course. And I think what you've just described is like remaining regulated and focusing on the task at hand <laughs> and mm-hmm. staying calm. And that can go a long way through, I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. a lot of different scenarios throughout the day or stressful situations oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that come yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, we had, yeah. I mean, I I always walked my kids around the classroom, around the school at the beginning of the year, just mm-hmm. standard, because school layouts can be very confusing. Um, and I know for me, I've always been very directionally challenged, and I've wondered if it's a trauma thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always, like, this is the restroom, this is the library, so kids know where everything is. I love that. Um, so, yeah, no, totally. I think a lot of, I mean, I know a lot of the kids I have fostered would, would really benefit that. And I'm, I'm always asking as a parent, like, can I take them through? Can we show them mm-hmm. around so they can see like where the exits are, like what, where you go to the yeah. bathroom yeah. or get food. I think that's yeah. such a small thing that gets missed, but mm-hmm. that makes a ton of yeah. sense. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Is there anything we've covered so much? Is there anything else that you feel is really important to creating sa- a safe classroom? Anything we didn't touch mm-hmm. on? Yeah, so just a few things. One thing that I forgot to mention is that in correcting behavior or like confronting a child when they've, you know, been out of line or whatever, I always try to look for opportunities um, for the child to succeed. I mm. like to look for like a second chance. I love to look for that. So like they, you know, they may throw pencils across the room and then I, you know, I'm like, okay, we need to sit over here for a few minutes, just calm down, whatever. And then maybe later I'll see them share a pencil with a friend. I'm like, oh, I saw that. I saw you sharing the pencil with a friend. Like we had kindness awards in my classroom too. And I was like, I'm going to write you a kindness award. And they'd be like, oh, you know, and they'd be like, wait, me? And that seemed to be a very foreign concept mm-hmm. to them to have somebody like praise them and be proud of them after they had just been in trouble. Hmm. And and I say in trouble very lightly. No, I know. In trouble I know. With me, it was not like 
Well, they, like, yes, there was a misstep. You know. I understand. Right. Right. <laughs> so that was a big thing that I did because I believe that everybody deserves, you know, we all want second chances and that's what I would want. You know, I always try to bring it back to what would I want? Yeah. You know, if I was the kid, you know, or if you just think um, about in your because, own workplace, cause we, yeah. I don't know. I screw up all the time, but <laughs> you, right. you wouldn't want right. to like it be doomsday. You know, you want to be able mm-hmm. to like recover and such a good point. Right finding right, opportunities yeah. to praise. I love that. Yes. Yes. Um, and even when it goes to like, you know, correcting misbehavior or talking about it, I always tried to have the attitude of like, I'm here to help you. I'm here to, um, you know, help you learn. And I'm here to help you learn how to control your emotions and understand your emotions. Mm-hmm. It's not just academic. It's also like just helping your brain know how to respond to the different things that your yeah. body is feeling. Yeah. Because I think in explaining correction of behavior in that way the kids saw it as having a purpose rather than I'm just like telling you like oh you're not supposed to do that like there was a why behind it so I did that a lot again it's not easy it takes a lot of extra work to do that you know and so yeah um as you said the reward yeah the the reward at the end is kids are feeling safe which can be life-changing for kids especially in foster care yeah Sorry, I cut be. you off. There was one be. more. Yeah. <laughs> there was one yeah, more thing no. you said. Yeah, no, just a little bit to add on to that. Yeah, it really can be. And I had a parent email my principal and my superintendent and me about that. Mm. She was like, this teacher, like, this is unreal. And I was like, Ooh. I was like. Well crying. deserved. Well deserved. <laughs> um, so the last thing I want to touch on really quickly is just responding to kids. Um, mm-hmm. I have a few like sentence stems that I put in my handout and I'm hoping to share with everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, instead mm-hmm. of saying to kids, like, what do you want? I like to ask them, what do you need? I feel like it's a more respectful way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think saying like, well, you know, what do you want? Like that can be very snappy and it can come off as rude. Um, and if you are with kids in any capacity you know that kids ask you literally like a million questions a day and so being <laughs> like what do you need and even yes. sometimes I would audibly take a breath and be like okay what do you need yeah <laughs> like, that's good I like give that. me a moment um and I like doing it because it validates kids it shows them that you're listening to them that you respect them and that you hear them mm-hmm. and I feel like sometimes as adults it's really easy to just brush kids off like no no I don't have time for that and sometimes we literally don't have time for that. Yes, and it's okay yeah. to say that. But there's there's a way you say it that's not like mm-hmm. squishing, squishing yeah. morale, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, like I said earlier, I really like to listen before offering solutions. And sometimes the behavior or whatever they're telling you is so complex and you need a moment to listen and be like, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. So I like to listen. I like to ask them, what do you want me to do? And I know that sometimes when I say that, adults are like, I'm not asking the kid that. Like, they're going to tell me, like, they want this, this, and this. And I'm always like, well, when you ask them, what do you want me to do? You're not making a promise. You're not saying, oh, I'm going to yeah. do whatever you ask. You're, you're just yes, listening to point. them. Mm-hmm. And you don't, I mean, you don't have to do what they say. And you can tell them that. You can be like, yeah, I can understand how you want that. But unfortunately, like, in this setting, that's not something that I can do. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Like, I wish I could do that for you, but it's not something I can do. And nine times out of 10, the, the kid will be content with that. They're like, yeah, oh, yeah I get you, it. They just I get it that out. you can't do yeah. it. They but were the hurt. They just need to get it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the last thing I will end with here is I often will have kids refuse to do the work, mm-hmm. um, especially yeah. like in one on one or small yeah. group or whole group or whatever. So I always try to remind teachers that your reaction matters. How you react to them refusing to do their work will either inspire them to try or either completely squish them Mm -hmm. and so and I learned that the hard way I accidentally squished a kid and there was no way they would do their work and I saw it as my fault and it really was and I apologized to them that's another thing I encourage apologize to kids when you make mistakes yes um so I always try to encourage people to ask kids um you know point to what you don't understand Mm. and most of the time I think almost every single time I've had a kid be like why don't I understand this and I'm like, okay, well, let's go over it. Because usually it's- Now there's something the, actionable. Yeah. Right. And usually like it's the misunderstanding and then they just cloak that in like, well, they don't want to do it. And I get it. Like, I don't like to do things that I don't understand. Yeah, totally. Like, would I would I want to do it if my boss was like, well, you have to do it because it's due or whatever. Yeah. Like, no, like no. I would want my boss to be like, 
okay, well, what do you not let's, understand about this? Yeah, like, how can I together. help you? How can I support well, yeah. you? How do I get you started? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And like I said, I feel like we as adults need to validate kids. We need to, we need to jump in those feelings with them and be like, yeah, I get it. You know, like mm-hmm. I'm here to help. I love that. So can teachers reach out to you? Can they, can they get more advice from you and talk to you about individual situations? And if so, how can they find you? Yes. So I recently wa- launched my own website. It's called experiencecareconsulting.com. Um, and I can share the link with you. Yep, I'll put Laura. it in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also have a handout, which kind of just covers everything that I've talked about in yes. very simple form. It's amazing. I've gotten to, I got a preview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm hoping to share that out with everyone. It's yes. uh, just a really easy way to just maybe put it up in your classroom, like just review it because I know that sometimes it's really hard Mm -hmm. to remember all these things and I get it um but yeah and so my consulting business I do one-on-one with foster and adoptive parents and prospective foster and adoptive parents but I am planning to add a teacher portion as well and I'm hoping to add like a a, just a generalized contact form so if people want to contact me and have a session with me just to talk about these kinds of things um that's something that I'm really excited to do. And it's honestly my dream. My dream is to go into classrooms and schools and just help teachers be more trauma informed. Yes. Well, you yeah. are, you are helping. I mean, I know you're helping on an individual basis with those kids. And then also I know teachers have learned so much. I've learned from you. I've like inputted your advice as I <laughs> talk to teachers. So if you're a foster parent and you're struggling with a teacher, I highly suggest reaching out to Tina as well. So thank you for sharing so much with us today. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I I always learn from you every time I listen. So thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for tuning in today and listening. I love Tina. I've been following her for so long. And every time I listen to her, I feel like, I have these new aha moments. So I hope you did too. And thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.